are, we are on chapter 20 of Hidden Figures, and this is called Degrees of Freedom. In February 1960, as the space task group pushed forward with the test of the Mercury capsule, four students from the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical at Black College in Greensboro, North Carolina, sat down with the whites-only section of the lunch counter at the Woolworths Drugstore. David Richmond, Franklin McCain, Easel Blair Jr., and Joseph McNeil tried, tried to order a cup, of coffee, a cup of coffee. The staff refused to serve them. The manager asked him to leave, but the students refused to leave until the store closed later that night. The nonviolent protest was just the beginning of what would become a new phase of the civil rights movement. The following day, the Greensboro Four had turned into 20 activists. On the third day, 60 students gathered at the Wood Woodsworth and on the fourth day, 300 had joined the, the demonstration. Within a week, similar peaceful protests had spread to other cities in North Carolina, and then into Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. The students called their protests sit-downs or sit-ins. Sometimes the police arrested the protesters and took them to, off to jail. The prison sentence that followed didn't discourage the activists. They did not intend to back down until they had defeated segregation. Protests in Hampton Hampton Institute in Virginia, the school in which Mary Jackson graduated from, was the first school outside of North Carolina to recognize a sit-in. The college had a direct link to the civil rights movement. Five years before, Rosa Parks, a seamstress in Montgomery, Alabama, had refused to give up her seat on a city bus to a white man, triggering a bus boycott led by Martin Luther King Jr. Parks received death threats, and she and her husband were fired from their jobs in Alabama. The president of the Hampton Institute offered Parks a job working as a hostess at the university's faculty dining room. She accepted, and she worked there from 1957 to 1958. When sit-ins came to Hampton years later, Christine Mann, who had left her home in North Carolina behind to attend college in Virginia, was an 18-year-old junior. She wanted to pursue a career in sciences, but her father insisted that she also earn a teaching certificate as a backup plan in case she would have trouble finding work. In addition to taking course in math and physics, Christine became involved in the civil rights movement. In protests that resembled those in Greensboro, Christine and some of her classmates marched to the lunch counter at the local drugstore in downtown Hampton. They tried to order food, but the attendants at the counter refused to serve them, so, they, so then they sat reading or working on homework assignments. They were quietly protesting. When they refused to leave, the owner shut down the store in the middle of the afternoon. The next month, 500 students staged a peaceful protest in downtown Hampton. We want to be treated as American citizens, said the outspoken leader of the student movement. If this means integration in all areas of life, that is what we want. The Hampton Institute campus was alive with the possibility of significant social change. Christine also joined voter registration drives, walking door-to-door -door in black neighborhoods, urging residents to register to vote in the November 1960 elections. A rumor circulated on the campus that the astronauts supported the student protests. The astronauts represented mainstream America. The very idea that these buzz-cut middle American men were standing with the student activists, adding their voice to the call for equal opportunity for all Americans, was thrilling. It didn't matter if it was true. It inspired them all. Progress at Langley in 1960s. The culture was changing at the Langley Research Center too. When Dorothy Von Hahn turned off the lights in the West Computing Office for the last time, she and the remaining women in the segregated pool were sent off to other divisions at the lab. The era of the West Computing, a separate division for African American women, was over. Dorothy Von Hahn was assigned to the newly built computer complex on Langley's west side. By the 1960s, Langley had centralized its computing operations into a group named the Analysis and Compu Computation Division. It served all the center's research operations as well as providing electronic computing services to the outside contractors. In the new division, Dorothy was reunited with many of the West computers as well as the other women who had worked in the East Computing Lab. More striking than the racial integration of the female mathematicians was the fact that men had joined the team. Computing had been promoted in a status from being all female service organization to a respected co-ed division. Computing was no longer considered women's work. However, with the increasing use of computer technology and aeronautical research, some of the older women at Langley who did not 
who still did most of their work using the older model mechanical calculators, fell out of touch. The early 1960s were a time of change in the history of computing, a dividing line between the time when computers were human and when they were machines. Computing jobs were no longer handed off to a room full, room full of women punching numbers into a $500 mechanical calculating machines. Room-sized computers that cost more than $1 million each now did the same work, and did it way faster. Faced with this new era in computing, 50-year-old Dorothy Von Hahn reinvented herself as a computer programmer. Engineers still came to her and asked for help. Now, instead of assigning the task to one of her staff or doing the computations herself, she programmed the calculations into an IBM computer and let the machine do the math. In the past, Dorothy would have set up the equations in the data sheet and showed one of the women computers how to fill it out. As a computer programmer, she converted the equations into the computer's language, Fortran, by using a special machine to punch holes into a seven, seven, seven by one, one third of an inch cards. Each card represented one set of instructions for the computer. The longer and more complex the program, the more cards Dorothy and or another programmer fed into the computer. The machines could not take more than 10,000 cards or 10,000 lines of instructions. Even modest programs could require a tray with hundreds of cards, which had to remain in the correct order. As powerful as the computers were, Project Mercury required even more electronic brain power than the Langley had available. At the end of the 1960, NASA purchased two IBM 790 computers and installed them in the state-of-the-art facility in Washington, D.C. That computer lab was part, of the, was part of the Goddard Space Flight Center, which opened in 1959 in Greenbelt, Maryland. NASA established a third computer data center in Bermuda. Together, there are three com together these three computers would be able to monitor and analyze all aspects of the space flights from launch to splashdown. Keeping in touch, orbiting Earth presented a number of communication challenges for NASA engineers. It was one of the it was one thing to have a flight take off from Cape Canaveral, Florida, and land in the Atlantic Ocean. These flights stayed within the communication range of the Mission Control in Florida and the data centers in DC and Bermuda. Orbital flights missions that sent an astronaut around the globe were more than were much more dangerous. The aircraft would pass out of a visual and radio contact with mission control for extended periods of time. NASA demanded con constant contact with the astronauts every minute of every orbit. The engineers at Langley had to build a worldwide com communication network between mission control and the orbiting spacecraft. Developing the two-way communication and tracking network was almost as challenging as building the spacecraft itself. It required the creation of 18 communica communication stations set up around the globe so that the orbiting astronaut was never out of touch. The computers also sounded the alarm at the first sight of the trouble. Any deviation from the proje projected flight path, evidence of malfunction on board the capsule, or abnormal vital signs from the astronauts would send mission control scrambling to s solve the problem. Engineers at Langley struggled to make their deadlines, but they couldn't afford to make any mistakes. The projected launch date slipped from 1960 to 1961. During this period, the Soviets struck again on April 12, 1961. Russian communist Yuri Duran became the first human in space and the first human to orbit Earth. We could have, been, we could have beaten them. We could have beaten them. Project Mercury's flight director, the engineer in charge of coordinating many of the aspects missions, said years later, NASA engineers didn't feel defeated, and they didn't experience the panic that followed the launch of Sputnik. The Soviet success was frustrating and embarrassing, but the Langley team responded with renewed passion for their mission. NASA and its network of contractors focused their talents and kept working. They were almost ready to launch. The Mercury Mission it would take a total of 1.2 million tests, simulations, inspections, verifications, experiments, checkouts, and dry runs to send the first American into, American into space. It also took several failed rocket tests and a hair-raising suborbital flight with a chimpanzee on board. The capsule landed so far from the recovery ships that it was nearly underwater when it finally plucked from the ocean. Ham, the astrochip, survived the flight. 
In a courageous move, NASA decided to broadcast the launch of Mercury Redstone 3 live on television. This would be the third time the Redstone rocket would be used to boost the Mercury capsule into flight over the Atlantic Ocean. At least 45 million Americans turned to watch the success or failure of the first United States main, manned space mission. Astronaut Alan Shepard strapped into the capsule just six feet in, di in di diameter and less than seven feet in height. The launch was successful and the spacecraft soared to an altitude of 116.5 miles above the Earth. The suborbital flight of the capsule Shepard made Freedom 7 lasted only 15 minutes and 22 seconds and covered 303 miles. Freedom 7 was a pale technolo technological achievement compared to the Russian's communist flight the month before, but it was success but its success helped President John F. Kennedy make a promise to the country to complete a goal significantly more ambitious, a manned mission to the moon. I believe that this nation could commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of a of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. President Kennedy said before a, a session of Congress three weeks after Shepard's splashdown. Um, oh, I thought I was done, but I have more to read here. Every NASA employee involved with the space program started to worry. They were already working nights and weekends to prepare for six more scheduled Mercury flights. NASA still hadn't completed its first orbital flight, and President Kennedy had promised that they were going to send a man to the moon. Was this an impossible dream? It was terrifying. It was terrifying and most exhilarating thing that they had ever heard. Getting to the moon, one of mankind's deepest and most enduring fantasies, had long had long been the dream of many at Langley as well, but with only one operational success under its belt and six Mercury missions to go, NASA's road to the moon seemed unimaginably complex. The engineers estimated that the upcoming orbital flight, including the fully manned global tracking network, required a team of 18,000 people. It would take many times more than, the, than that to complete a lunar landing. A new mission control. It became clear that NASA was going to have to expand its facilities and workforce if the program was going to reach the goal of putting a man on the moon. And the rumor spread that the space task group was going to be leaving Hampton, Virginia. The Langley employees campaigned to keep mission control at their base, but NASA was considering other sites. In 1969, nine locations were shortlisted as, possi as possibilities, but Virginia was not one of them. Powerful Texans in Congress used their influence, and Houston was chosen as a site. With Project Mercury in full spring, swing and a brand new research center ready to open in Houston, NASA, NASA named it the Manned Spacecraft Center. The space program had more work than it could handle. Katherine Johnson had been asked to transfer to Houston with the group, but she and her husband decided to remain in Virginia in order to stay close to their families. Mission Control might have moved to Houston, but Langley was still a beehive of space activity for Katherine Johnson and her colleagues, who were busy laying the groundwork for meeting NASA's greatest challenge, sending a man to the moon and bringing him home safely. Um, for this chapter, all I want you to do is make a prediction of what you think is going to happen next.